welcome to Why We Do What We Do. I am your host, Abraham. I'm your co-host, Ryan O. And so we're talking today about uh, logical fallacies. Yes, specifically circular reasoning, right? Circular in a circle. Yes. <laughs> I don't know why I even said that. <laughs> um, so I actually, I really wanted to cover this topic, and this is something that I've been interested in for a long time, even though, as we'll learn... Logical fallacies and circular reasoning aren't really going to help you in life. (laughs) Um, I actually really enjoy talking about them, especially because I find it useful to evaluate how I conceptualize things and how I talk about things if I can avoid making simple errors in logic. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I've, I liked them for a bit and then I was just like, it was an area that I wasn't super good at, which like anybody else, like if you struggle in something, like it's hard to kind of like them. Um, Me and skateboarding. Yeah. (laughs) I'm excited to kind of talk about them again a little bit. Um, They are useful for me. um, And especially the circular reasoning one oftentimes. Yeah. It's a fun one to teach. And that was actually one of the reasons I wanted to go after circular reasoning in particular is because this shows up so much and it, it's often sort of my first line of defense when I am looking at some of the psychological research and arguments is, uh, is this logically sound on its face? Yeah. And so that's where a lot of my interest lies in this. And it, one important take home we're going to have from this whole episode is a, a logical fallacy, fallacy is not going to prove one way or another whether or not a philosophical or conceptual issue is valid or sound. Um, but it can help you sort of deconstruct arguments so that you are at least making coherent statements that can therefore lead to a more fruitful discussion. Yeah, the way I've kind of understood it is like if you're in the world of the internet, it leads to all out battles. But if you're <laughs> if right. you're in the world of trying to like really understand something very well and you're working with some people that it will work with you on understanding these things, then it's a very useful thing to bring into discussion. Right. Is yeah. How logical are we being? And exactly. uh, there's been a lot of personal growth for me personally, professionally, as a result of using in that context. Right. Um, but it's in other mediums when people aren't okay with talking about or recognizing the differences in the philosophical assumptions and those sort of things that it, it gets really hard to kind of use them. Yeah. And I, um, I made the mistake <laughs> On a couple of occasions now, uh, where in like a comments thing online, I pointed out that I I actually said, I agree with your conclusion, but technically that was a logical fallacy. And uh, needless to say, that person and I are not friends. They were very Uh offended by (laughs) my pointing this out. So uh, it certainly doesn't, it also seems to not help necessarily with my communicating with other people and, and trying to help them construct logical arguments, at least in instances where I don't know them very well. But the reason I came, became familiar with this was through um, part of my own like language and logic being critiqued with logical fallacies, and I couldn't really say, you're right, uh, or I couldn't say, you're wrong, I'm right. I really sort of just had to land on, oh, I need to talk about this in a, in a more well-constructed way. Yeah. So a logical fallacy, as we sort of alluded to already, is a logic and reasoning um, and it's, there are two different kinds that are discussed and there's actually other kinds if you really dig deep, yeah. but the two main kinds are you have formal logical fallacies, which are almost in a sense, they're formal because they are, comp- they're false in a like logically, um, coherent sense. Yeah, exactly right. Like they, they just can't be true yeah. and, um, or there, there is something that is inherently wrong with them, but most logical fallacies and the one we're going to talk about today are what are called informal logical fallacies and the problem with uh or what's going on with an informal logical fallacy means that it's invalid as an argument because of its context and it doesn't necessarily mean that the uh, components of it are invalid um just that the way that the argument is set up makes it a um a flawed logical statement yeah okay okay so in particular that's about as much as we're going to get into like what logical fallacies are. <laughs> yeah, there's a like whole that. yeah, there's a whole bunch of different types of logical fallacies, and actually many of them are so similar that they're sometimes used interchangeably. And so the one I'm talking about today is called circular reasoning, but this is also called cir- circular proving, circular logic. Um, it's often used interchangeably with another logical fallacy called begging the question mm-hmm. or um, post hoc ergo propter hoc. 
for um, after this, therefore, because of this. Mm-hmm. That's what post hoc ergo propter hoc means. And so these all fit into this idea that um, in circular reasoning, you have your um, your premise or your um, your main your main idea, and then a following statement that essentially is the same statement as the main idea. So if I get you right, circular reasoning is bad because circular reasoning is bad. Right. And another one I like to give when I'm teaching this is like grass is green because of its greenness. Actually, let's go ahead and just jump right into how this relates to psychology. Because probably we've been talking about logical fallacies, but I haven't even really discussed why on a psychology podcast we're talking about logical fallacies. Yeah. And the the reason is where this might start to apply. And I, I want to dig into as many as we can examples and non-examples. Okay. Cool. Okay. So one example that's really common is something like, uh, I'm just going to go with a, a disorder of like yeah. ADHD. Okay. So we'll say that this kid is, and I, I'm not saying that ADHD is a logical fallacy, but how it's used to explain behavior sometimes Use is. That way. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So if I were to say, for example, this kid is acting up in class and he's not paying attention, and then the answer become, becomes, it's because he has ADHD. And I say, well, how do you know he has ADHD? Uh-huh. And then the answer to that is because he's acting up in class. Well, why is he acting up in class? Because he has ADHD. How do you know he has ADHD? And it just goes round and round in a circle where you're really just describing what he's doing by saying he has ADHD. You're not explaining what the cause of his behavior is. Yeah, so you can get the root mechanism or the root causes. Exactly yeah. right. And so, um, And that's really common. Now, people do this. So frequent in their everyday language, um, it, it's just it's an easy thing to sort of slip into. Of uh, we d- we think we've explained something once we've given it a name. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's come up with a couple more examples to really il- really illustrate the point. Yeah. Why is that guy so good at that sport? Because he's talented. Yeah. Well, how do we know he's talented? Well, because he's so good. Look at him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, why is he so good? Because he's talented. Yeah. Uh, the kid who's doing bad in school, uh, it's because they're stupid. But how do I know they're stupid? Because they're doing bad in school. Uh-huh. This is like sort of your classic, um, I think, dismissive reasoning of when someone asks you, well, why is this happening? Yeah. It, because it's happening. Yeah. There's no other explanation. It just is. Yeah, that's one thing I really remember when it comes to like learning about what circular reasoning was. Like, mm-hmm. as soon as I realized uh, how to kind of identify it, I realized it was all over the place. Yeah, like not only in my own language sometimes, mm-hmm. um, but when I was having conversations with you know loved ones professionally, yeah. um, listening to the radio, like on the internet, reading things, like it was just it was everywhere. Right. Yeah. And uh, another one. You know, my, my mom used this as like, uh, how do we know that they're, uh, they have good genes? Oh, because they're smart. Well, why are they smart? Because they have good genes or yeah. good genetics. And, uh, I had, you know, I sort of pointed that out. I'm like, that's technically just a going in a circle, you know, you, yeah. we don't actually know, but what you could actually do to avoid getting in a circle is to actually look at how we know they have good genes. Well, let's test it and find out. Like, yeah. but then the problem is what do you mean by good? Yeah. Um, and so a lot of these statements are sort of evaluative and a lot of them are really descriptive. So where the, where the error comes in when we're talking about um, the, the logical or, or the circular reasoning and logic is that it's usually being just descriptive for the sake of being descriptive. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm going to challenge you though. So you are, uh, you talked about, you made your profession in behavior analysis and behavior analysis commonly employs this concept of reinforcement. Uh-huh. All right. So you probably heard this one before, Maybe. but <laughs> you got me nervous. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll see how well you do with it. So the, the challenge goes that I'm going to give you mm-hmm. is that, all right. Um, it, let's say that a kid is, um, doing something and then you provide some kind of reinforcement, um, and then their behavior increases. Why did the behavior increase? Because of the reinforcement? Well, how do you know that it was the reinforcement? I'm just joking with you. <laughs> <laughs> because the behavior increased. And so yeah. that's that's sort of what the what the challenge is. So what do you think? How do you get out of that? With the reinforcement? Yeah. Specifically? Um, yeah, so uh, it can be used as a descriptive term, um, but there's also, uh, like you were saying, like we can actually like test this and look at these sort of things, right? Mm-hmm. So we can like investigate it more. Um, sure. So... For example, there's there's a lot of different ways we can go about doing that sort of thing, um, but essentially I could go back repeated times 
um, and see if reinforcement continues to be the variable that works. Yeah. I could vary it with other things that we might think might be the key variables as well. Sure. And over repeated times of varying different conditions, I could be like, hey, this is, we got a lot of evidence showing that like this is the variable that's actually causing this. Sure. Does that, does that help get us out of that? I think so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Cool. And yeah, so if it's essentially it's like don't make a claim of like a cause effect relationship without being able to take the step back to explain like what is the actual cause and how do we know what the actual effect was of that cause. Yeah. And I think that gets there's a bigger conversation to have about what we sort of mean conceptually about cause and effect. Mm -hmm. Um and especially when it comes to behavior and psychology. Yeah. Uh, cuz a lot of people are going to look at, you know, the co looking at the behavior as being the effect of the brain mechanism, which was the cause, but that was actually the effect of a chain event that happened somewhere. This is very complicated. Yeah, yeah. But again, that's sort of stepping away from how do we just evaluate these claims in terms of psychological events and whether or not they at least, and I say at least because <laughs> I kind of mean it, stand up to the scrutiny of just a simple logical test. Yeah. And another one I kind of want to talk about is this idea of consciousness, which really warrants its own like series of episodes probably. Yeah. But if we're to ask like, um, is this organism, like let's say a human, is a human yeah. conscious? Uh, yes, because we see that they can report, they can self-reflect. Yeah. And how do we know, like uh, why is self-reflecting um, or how do we know that their self-reflecting is consciousness? Um, because they're self-reflecting, why are they self-reflecting? Because they're conscious. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So this is an example yeah. of that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just really easy to do this. Yeah, it's all over the place. So again, just to sort of, this is probably going to be a relatively short episode, but I want to hit this major point in here that when we're talking about logical fallacies and um, and how these relate to the world, um, these don't represent like a law of the natural world. It's not – yeah. Like a logical fallacy is not like a law of nature where it's there's definitely a right or wrong answer. Mm -hmm. Again, it's just to sort of evaluate these arguments and these ideas and these concepts and say like, do these stand up in the face of a uh, close um, understanding and like a really close evaluation yeah. um, when they just are sort of test on the merit of are these logical statements? Yeah. Is this just a trick of our own language where we can sort of talk ourselves into believing anything because – any conclusion can fit with any um, starting point. Yeah. Yeah, they've been really useful for me in, in like my practice to various degrees because what I can do is I can kind of work with colleagues and saying like, is this really, you know, the reason why we think that this thing or what might be influencing this, you know, behavior or mm -hmm. the system? Um, and since we have that shared belief and like how the world kind of works, mm -hmm. um, we don't get into those discussions of, you know, or those arguments and those sort of like high tension things can kind of happen as a result of like pointing out each other's logical fallacies. Since right. we believe in the same world, it's just kind of like, oh, yeah, I was off on that. Like, what, what, how do I talk about that more accurately? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, so that's really been, I guess, the, where I've really appreciated knowing them and like where they've provided, provided some utility for me. Sure. So I think maybe a, a simple test that you can do to sort of figure out if, the statement that you're making or the claim that you're making fits inside of this logical or the circular reasoning, this logical fallacy is, is just asking simply, how do you know? And if the, how do you know is the same answer as your starting <laughs> point, then you might be sort of in trouble of, of the circular reasoning. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, if a, um, then, or if B because of a, then a because of B, um, or if a is true because B is true, then B is true because a is true that sort of structure of the argument, then you kind of know that you're really just walking in circles yeah. and not that you are not that really either of your starting point or your conclusion is invalid or false, just that you haven't gone far enough. Yeah. There's to more to, explain. yeah, there's more to investigate, more right. to understand, more to look at. Exactly. Yeah. So it actually is a great way. Um, it's, I'm, I'm sort of coming to this realization right now as we're mm -hmm. talking about this then that there's some utility in this and helping you create sort of a more uh, comprehensive investigation. So we, we want to do psychology and we want to do psychology as science. And if we're only getting to the point of congratulating ourselves because we've described something so well and we haven't actually explained it, 
then this might be a tool that we now have to sort of say, well, maybe there's more to do. There's more to learn Mm -hmm. about this thing we want to learn about. Um, Just to throw a few more concepts under the bus in terms of causes of behavior, uh, a really common one I hear is the personality. Yeah. So why does this person uh, gamble so much because they have an addictive personality? Mm -hmm. How do you know they have an addictive personality? (laughs) They gamble so much. Yeah. Uh, This also, there's there's another historical sort of um, discussion to have, but for a while after Darwin's theory of evolution became really, really popular, it was really common to try and explain everything in terms of instinct. And it'd be like, why why does this person, uh, let's actually go with genders on this one, we'll have yeah. two issues at once. Uh, why does this person really like hunting um, because he's a man, uh, or because he has a hunting instinct that's very manly. Um, yeah. And so the common explanation for behavior, if it happened at all, was just, they must have that instinct. Yeah. If the behavior happened, they had that instinct. And that's yeah. exactly circular reasoning, like encapsulated in the most, <laughs> the, the, I mean, the most descriptive yeah. way it could be. Because if we're, you're simply taking what is happening and saying that it is, you are implying a cause of that yep. based on the behavior itself. Yep. Um, you know, if they're drinking, it's because they have an alcoholic instinct. Yeah. And so, again, like the question you always ask, how do you know? That's the simple test. And if the, the answer is because they drink a lot, well, why do they drink a lot? Because they have a drinking instinct. Yeah. Then you know you've got more questions to answer. Yeah. No, and an instinct one, there's actually a way we can kind of dive into that in another episode with some of like the work of like Zingy and Guo and those, mm-hmm. like how they kind of jump into those and, so long ago and right. kind of like sort of laying a foundation of how to approach those. That way we can give our listeners like here's how you could uh, kind of investigate instincts or something oh, yeah. that's used right in these circular reasoning sort of ways right um and kind of like give them some tools to kind of like jump in more there in general um, i think even just general uh reflex psychology reflective psychology yep. from the 1800s yeah yeah so yeah we'll have to curb that one do that one soon cool um yeah so uh there's there's a lot of these concepts we could tackle like i, I said originally let's list as many as we can that could go on forever I think the real point of this is to start when you hear these psychological terms and these concepts, and especially when you start hearing explanations of behavior, see if you can apply that test. Uh, how do you know? See if it stands up to the level of, is this a logically sound argument? And it might even be the case that you could say this was an instinct, mm-hmm. but the, the answer, how do you know, is goes beyond the fact that it's just happening. We could actually find ways to test what instinct is. And the same thing is true for like, um, is this uh, caused by their personality? Well, the answer will almost be, always be no, but um, <laughs> there, there, are, there are certain things that we can test and sort of like, uh, how, how do genes play a role in this? How does yeah. the brain play a role in this? Yeah. Um, uh, going back to reinforcement, how does reinforcement yeah. play a role in this? And things that we can test and look at, how can we evaluate these things yeah. that we think might be causes systematically yeah. and not just assume that we found the yeah. answer because we can say, I have a name for this. Yeah, and if it sounds like we're saying like the world's more complex than we think it is, and like it, that's not really what's going on here. Like yeah. it, it kind of makes me remember, um, like if you assume the world is uh, simple, and then you go out there and kind of look, and everything's really complex, you're just kind of like overwhelmed. But if mm-hmm. you kind of flip that on, like, hey, there's a lot of variables that might go into the world, mm-hmm. and like how we understand things, right? And then you go out there and look, you're like, hey, uh, look at that, it's pretty simple, right? Like, yeah, that little trick's been useful for me. Um, so I just want to clarify, like to listeners that like uh sounds like we might be saying like oh there's a lot more and we're complicating the situation but um i've actually found that as you take that perspective you actually have a lot more things that are kind of like tangible per right. se that you can actually use as like a way to understand the world a little bit better yeah um, i it, and it's, why we do what we do or whatever that is yeah <laughs> <laughs> That's, we're trying to at least once per episode <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's, it's a perfect, um, not perfect. It's just one of those tools of like, I actually really like sort of trying to demystify the experiences and like they seem these, these elements of what happens in the natural world seem kind of magical on their face, Mm -hmm. um, or at least at their first glance. And I am, I personally like taking the approach of understanding why things happen and uh and it's a you know, capitalizing on the moment why we do what we do <laughs> yeah i think everyone I, does yeah Absolutely and, named. yeah exactly right <laughs> yeah and so we're we are just trying to find these ways of approaching these subjects uh where we can understand them 
by just in a way it's making it more simple because we're focusing on the the more I want to say comprehensive but it's it's just like the the more relevant variables and not getting so wrapped up in how we talk about them that our language becomes the thing we're interested in yeah to the exclusion of the real world events that are happening yeah how to kind of not get caught up and be kind of happy and satisfied and be able to move forward right? exactly with the way you understand things yeah don't get don't don't get so satisfied with your own verbal tricks that you forget to look at the real world yeah cool, cool. will you have anything else you want to say about this uh I think we're good. Okay. Yeah. Kind of a short one. Yeah. That's okay. That's all right. I think what we're, I wanted to do this because I think we're going to be using this tool when we're going to talk about circular reasoning some more when we get into a more deep dive of other topics specifically. And we'll want to be able to try and pull them apart and be like, hey, is this standing up to this this simple test? You know what I mean? And there are also, there are other logical fallacies. We might cover them. We might even do another episode where we just cover a few of them and give some more examples. Um, we're but again, we're definitely going with the flow on this. That's right. <laughs> Each this, week we see what we have and we, that's we, right. We move forward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is just, uh, it's just an exercise in, uh, we want to, re- I wanted to relate this to psychology because it's going to be relevant and other things might be relevant as well. Um, but I like this one in particular, but yeah, so that's, that's, I think all I got on circular yeah. reasoning post hoc ergo propter hoc. Uh, just remember circular reasoning is bad because circular reasoning is bad. <laughs> This is uh, (laughs) Abraham and Rhino. Uh, You've been listening to Why We Do What We Do. Yep. Thanks for listening. (laughs) Appreciate appreciate your time. Signing off. Thanks for listening to Why We Do What We Do. If you like what you heard and would like to support the show, please consider heading over to our Patreon account at patreon.com slash podcast. Every little bit helps, and we're continuously lining up perks and merch for our supporters. Contact us on any social media platform at WWD Podcast or email us at info at www.podcast.com. You can learn more about this episode and other episodes by going to www.podcast.com. There you will find links and detailed and shareable show notes. This episode of Why We Do What We Do was written and produced by Ryan O. and Abraham, artwork and logo design by Andrew Pollock at nogdesigns.com, video and production assistance from Tyler Bessier, and music courtesy of Justin Greenhouse.